welcome to the webinar. The webinar's name is Developing and Assessing Student Proficiency Through the Use of Authentic Materials. I am Tanya Slane, and I'm pleased to be kicking off this webinar this afternoon. A couple of housekeeping items. As participants, you are in listen-only mode. If you would like to interact with our speaker, you can do so via the question and the chat box. The speaker will be asking for engagement during this webinar and will host a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. I'll be happy to read off the questions or chats that you've entered so that Milani can respond to you all appropriately. If we run out of time, we will make sure that we address your questions and send you responses individually. If you are having technical issues, please reach out via our chat box. Our marketing director, Chris Poza, will do his best to assist. Also, for housekeeping purposes, we are recording this session and we plan to send each of you a recorded session as well as the PowerPoint presentation so that you can review and re-review at your leisure. A little bit more about our sponsor from this webinar, Xanadu Publishing. With 20 years of custom publishing experience, supporting both higher education and K-12 schools, Xanadu Publishing has been helping districts improve relevancy, equity, and access through customized materials. Rather than asking students to adapt to a standard off-the-shelf resource, Xanadu's custom solutions help you make education personalized and affordable by giving you control to create unique materials based on your students' needs. At Xanadu, we empower curriculum creators to take back control over the content, costs, and quality of your instructional materials. You may be asking yourself, why would districts be interested in custom publishing today? We've heard from our partners that the traditional textbook model is not meeting the needs of the classroom today. One textbook does not meet the, states, the needs of every student across the nation. Our students are unique. Our instructional materials should be too. Districts also need the flexibility to alter instructional content based off of current events, unexpected standards changes, new ma mandates, or just the ability to adapt curriculum. We are also very well aware that the cost of textbooks are at an all-time high and budgets are shrinking, which are making content decisions tough. Xanadu Publishing is proud to have helped districts across the United States create custom materials. Our guest of honor, Melanie, is going to address the benefits of using authentic text in world languages. Most likely, the relevant authentic text will not be found in an off-the-shelf resource. Xanadu Publishing is suited to support your districts in the creation of a workbook or a reader that can include a variety of materials ranging from authentic text, primary sources, articles, excerpts, poems, or perhaps even song lyrics. After this presentation, we will display contact information for those who are interested in scheduling a complimentary custom consult with Xanadu Publishing. And now for the main event, I'm pleased to introduce our host for today's webinar. Next slide. <clears throat> Melanie Milo has been teaching German as a foreign language at a middle school, high school, and at the collegiate level since 2008. Currently, she teaches German at Chandler High School in Chandler, Arizona. In 2019, Melanie was one of the five finalists for Actful's Teacher of the Year Award. After being chosen as the Southwest Skolt and Arizona Teacher of the Year, congratulations to you, Melanie, and I will hand the reins of this webinar over to you. Thank you. And also from me, a very heartfelt welcome. I'm very excited that so many of you decide today to join this webinar. And before we get started, I would like to go over our learning goals. So at the end of this webinar, you can hopefully, but I'm very confident to say, differentiate between performance and proficiency. You will be able to better align your learning targets to the World Readiness Standards, Actiful's proficiency guidelines, and an assessful Actiful can do statements, and through all of that, better support your students to ensure larger gains towards proficiency by incorporating authentic materials into your curriculum. Let's start out with what performance is. So performance is what you do with your classroom 
in with your students in the classroom. So it would be the practice use of a specific grammatical function or vocabulary words within the target language. And uh, in comparison to proficiency, proficiency is the unrehearsed spontaneous use of the target language in real world situations. So what that means is that we need to come up with ways to provide our students in the performance setting, so in our instructor setting, with experiences that are similar to the real world and will prepare them to be um, able to function in the real world. So let's keep these two definitions in mind because I'm going to quiz you and you have to continue using the chat function. I'm going to show you four scenarios at the end of the introduction of each scenario. You have to make a decision. Is this an example of a performance or of a proficiency? So let's read it one more time over what performance is in proficiency before the test starts. Scenario number one. Students watch a never before seen clip and answer questions about it in the target language. What do you believe this is? Performance or proficiency? This would be the example of proficiency because the clip has never been seen before and the students spontaneously unrehearsed have to answer questions in the target language about the clip. Next example, next chance. Students complete a quick writing assignment for two to three minutes after reading an authentic text discussed in class. What do you think? Is this an example of performance or proficiency? Please write your answer in the chat. This would be an example of performance. So after the student, after the teacher had gone over, um, you know, a, a reading with the students uh, in class and answered questions and worked with the text, the students then have to show the understanding of the text by producing a quick write. Our third example. The teacher performs quarterly interviews of students on a variety of unrehearsed topics. What do you believe? Is this an example of performance or proficiency? This again would be an example of proficiency. So sure, after the students spend a whole quarter with the teacher in the classroom and they have practiced certain grammatical uh, functions uh, and have acquired the vocabulary words on this specific topics, now the teacher see, sees and assesses if the student is actually able to produce uh, answers to unrehearsed questions. So again, this is an example of proficiency. So our last scenario is the following. The teacher introduces a story to students. Afterwards, students retell the same story to appear using a whiteboard. What do you believe is this? Is this an example of performance or proficiency? This would be an example of performance. Again, after the story was discussed with the uh, teacher and this, with the students, the students retelling the story, maybe by drawing pictures and then using the pictures to retelling the story. So if we wanna recap one more time, so what is performance? So performance is based on what was learned and practiced in class but then it's applied to another task within a familiar context, but not identical to what has been done in class. Then proficiency in comparison, first of all, is um, that the language learner can, regardless of where, when, or how language was acquired, use the language in a spontaneous and unrehearsed setting. So when we now think about the way that we lesson plan or unit plan or write our curricula, we need to really have this have, have a goals in mind when we do so. So what do we want our students to do at the end of a school year, a unit, or a semester, or a quarter? And to do so, and to do so well, we need to use our foundation of great unit lesson planning. And that would be Actifel's proficiency guidelines, the necessity for Actifel can do statements, and the world readiness standards for learning languages.
So unfortunately, we don't have enough time to dig into everything really deep and like, you know, take it apart. Uh, so if you have any follow-up questions, uh, be free to write them later on in the chat and I will be able to reach out to you afterwards to answer your questions. But we're going to still, you know, like look at it a little bit so you guys can get a good overview of what these three things are. So let's look at the proficiency guidelines, active for proficiency guidelines. They describe the tasks that speakers can handle at each at a, at a specific level. So as well as the content, the context, and the accuracy, and the discord types associated with the task at each level. So the levels we have to keep in mind do not describe a grade or an age level, but it's the ability of a student to perform at a particular proficiency level. So as we see right here, the proficiency levels are um, divided into novice level, the intermediate level, the advanced level, and there's actually two additional levels which I have not mentioned here, the so-called superior distinguished level, and these are the highest level, and um, the reason why they are not here and also in many world language uh, standards for um, specific states are not listed is because they are not considered the outcome of a K-12 learning. So they are superior distinguished that would be uh, the level of a native speaker. Oftentimes, even at um, native speakers are just on an advanced level. So why is this important? I would argue that the, um, that the pathway to proficiency is really the key to success for you and your students for um, learning to become proficient speakers of the target language. And how do you get there? So the student needs to know at what level they're currently on and how they're going to progress to the next level. So that way they know, so by uh, forecasting what the, what the students will be able to do, they know what they're working towards to, so they have a goal, they have a little carrot that is dangling in front of them. So what do we understand under, as, under the novice level? So that stands for a student being able to communicate with words or, or characters or phrases to express basic needs on familiar topics that have been highly practiced and memorized in class. And then we progress through the mid, novice mid, novice high into the intermediate level. An intermediate language learner will be able to communicate with sentences um, and with some connected sentences by expressing and also elaborating on basic needs. So we're going into a little more of the depth. So we see some subordinating conjunctions, because, and if, and whatnot. And, as so on and so forth. So the learners um, have as a, enough language knowledge and also express themselves accurately. And then as we progress up to the advanced level, here the students can communicate in, as on varieties of topics and they can extend here, they can give more detail and they can, for instance, respond and resolve problems. So for today's sake, we're going to focus on the novice mid learner. But before we do this, we're going to see what are actually the Nassess for active or can do statements. So the Nassess for active or can do statements for intercultural communication are a reflection tool for the language learner, which includes a set of examples and scenarios that show the learners how to use the language and the knowledge of the culture to demonstrate intercultural communicative competence. So what that means is when you um, open up the NSF Active for Can Do statements, you see for each uh, performance level, a proficiency, sorry, proficiency level, you see a list of I can statements. And they are um, organized according to the interpretive communication skill, the interpersonal communication skill, and the presentation communication skill. It always says, tells the students what the student can do. So for instance, when we look at the um, novice level here and our proficiency benchmark, it says, I can communicate in spontaneous spoken, written or signed conversations on both very familiar and everyday topics using a variety of practice or memorized words and phrases and simple sentences and questions. So you might wonder maybe, why did I choose the novice mid learner? And there are a couple of reasons. I have heard many uh, teachers in the past lamenting the fact that they feel that authentic materials are way too difficult to implement in the beginning. So in the novice level learner classes, 
um, and they don't, they don't know how to handle this because uh, it's difficult for them to stay in the target language or to encourage the students to stay in the target language. But what we have to keep in mind is that we can always adapt the task to the text. So we can give our novice learner a more advanced text. Um, and you know, a text can be anything from a written text. It can be an audio, it can be a visual. Um, and we can give them designed to their ability level activities to do with maybe what some of us would consider a more advanced text. So today, or later on in a little bit, I will show you some examples of how I use authentic materials with the mid or novice mid learner. So then here we have um, the world readiness standard. So that's our third leg for our perfect or very good uh, lesson planning and unit planning. So the World Readiness Standards are also known as the five C's and they're compromised out of the following goal areas, communication, cultures, connections, comparison, and communities. So communication is uh, again, like divided into interpersonal communication, interpretive communication, and presentation, presentational communication. So when we think of interpretive communication, that means that a learner understands and interpret and analyzes what is heard, read, and viewed on a variety of topics. And interpersonal communication is when the learner is able to interact and negotiate meaning in spoken, signed, or written conversations to share information, reactions, feelings, and opinions. And then the third uh, uh, third standard, presentation communication, is when the learner is able to present information, concepts, um, ideas, to inform, explain, persuade, um, and or narrate on you know various uh, topics. So what we have to keep in mind here, why the world readiness standards are so important, is sure our focus as language teachers is to teach our students how to communicate so that a native speaker is able to understand what they want to convey. But all this should be done in conjunction and not in isolation, by or through culture. And so when we look at the uh, five C's, we see cultures, connections, comparison, communities. I, I would say we could lump all this together into, for me, I would say this is the culture, um, the, the culture category, so to say. Because when we uh, teach language through culture, we're always comparing it to what we are familiar with, our home cultures. We compare it to that what we learn in the target language about the target culture, the practices uh, and whatnot. And we make connections, we see similarities, we see diff differences, and we connect them to what's familiar to us. And we can build up on this. And then all this gained knowledge, so that, that language knowledge and the knowledge about the culture, we can then again bring back to our communities and then educate them about what we have learned in the language uh, classroom. Also, we have the opportunity when we bump, like in, for instance, with my students, if they bump into a speaker of German over here, they can communicate with that. Uh, person in German, or if they're you know, going to Germany or to the German speaking world for that matter, they're able to communicate so hopefully successfully with um, this, the, the people they meet over there. So they're building and growing communities. And I really like this quote here from Bennett, Bennett and Alan. Uh, it's an oldie but goodie. And they it's like it's summarized from the article, the person who learns language without learning culture risks becoming a fluent fool. And that is true. When I learned uh, English, I learned English for nine years in school, and then I went to study English because I felt very confident about my uh, language knowledge. Um, but I didn't really learn a lot about, uh, a lot about the culture, uh, or maybe not enough uh, language either for that matter. And if you read my blog post, you will figure out why that is. Um, but you make, you know, small little mistakes that you are unaware. And oftentimes, you know, the, these little cultural um, differences can't be taught necessarily in the, in the classroom. Um, therefore, sometimes it's very nice if you have a native speaker who can teach the language, or if you are not a native speaker of the language you teach, to reach out to the community of native speakers and learn from them. And I would like to share one little story here. When I first came to the United States, um, I planned a birthday party for my son and I wrote inv invitations that the birthday party would take place at 15 o'clock. And not knowingly that many people are not familiar or not, or not using the military clock, uh, I got a couple of messages and people asking me, what does it mean 15 o'clock? 
And so I had to learn, you know, that um, over here we use 3 p.m. instead. So I felt a little bit like um, a fool because sure, I knew the language pretty well. So I was able to write the invitation, but I made this little, little, little faux pas of not writing the time correctly. So again, this is, you know, a semi good example of why a culture is so important to be taught in conjunction with the language. So let's go and dive into um, a little um, yeah, background information on what authentic materials are. So what makes a text an authentic text? I have heard many people who are struggling with the term authentic. So basically what it is, an authentic text is a text written, so a text visual audio recording or video, written or created for a native speaker, uh, by the native speaker for pleasure or to convey information, and which stands as, as by itself as a cultural artifact of real language use. So with that definition, I think we can come up with our own ideas of what an authentic text could be. And I put here, I, come up, I came up with a list, I mean, that is not an extensive list. There are many, many, many more uh, materials that count as a printed authentic material or, so, or as an auditory material. But here you have an, an, an overview. And also in the blog post, you see an example um, of an IPA, but only of the first part of the inter interpretive part, you will see um, how I used a receipt, a supermarket receipt in the uh, novice level. Uh, the students have to answer questions about the receipt um, and also a culture question. So a receipt, maybe some of you would have thought, uh, why the heck would you use a uh, receipt? I mean, it is an authentic uh, source and that can be used and can be used very effectively to promote students to use the target language and also to see what they have learned about the target culture. So when I plan for my lessons or for my unit, I usually have this little um, visual hanging on my wall just to keep myself reminded because uh, when I plan, I always try to have the four language skills in every lesson. I always have a little something to read, something that the students have to listen to. I mean, listening also counts. It doesn't always have to be an audio recording or a video clip. I mean, just me alone. Uh, speaking in German or their classmates speaking the target language counts as a listening activity because we have to interpret meaning, meaning right there. Also something to write and sure enough to speak. So my students know when they come into my classroom that it has to be in German. So how do I do this with a novice level? I mean, they have a limited vocabulary. Um, I always tell them Denglish is allowed. So Deutsch and English mixed together, Denglish is allowed. Uh, but I always encourage them to really use all the words that they already know in German, in German, and not to you know, be lazy and use the English word instead. So um, in my blog, in, uh, I have the, the focus was food. I like to eat, I like to cook. Um, and I always feel like food brings people together. And I also would like uh, to focus right here in the webinar on the unit of eating out and fast food. So as I said, when I start out planning a unit, I always look at my instructional goals. So what is it that I would like to achieve with this unit? And what I do is I use an assessful active force can do statements to get a little help in formulating my uh, learning goals. And then also I uh, already designed my assessment and I love to use integrated performance assessment. And again, if there's something that you're unfamiliar, you can uh, sure enough reach out and I'm more than happy to uh, guide you in a direction so you can learn more about it. So once I have my instructional goals, my assessment figured out, I think about the activities and tasks that I would like my students to do so that they're able to pass the assessment. So here's some examples of, of activities and tasks that I do with my novice learner. I love to give my students infographs and right here, this infograph is about uh, popular fast foods uh, of the Germans. So what do they like to eat when they go out and eat fast food? And here you have two options. Option one would you have your students interpret the info infographic. What I do, especially in the beginning year, I give them Redemittel. So these are like language phrases that they can use to interpret the infograph. So usually in the first semester, as you see in option two, I have specific questions. I want my students to answer about the infograph. But then as we progress through the school year, I then want them to start, you know, writing sentences using these phrases and then eventually be able to describe and talk about an infographic without the phrases. And then what this would be nice and as an extension um, idea is 
to have your students discuss as a class or in a small group at first what their favorite fast food items are and to which uh, fast food restaurants they go. You can again use that information to create a class survey and then a chart the students again have to analyze. So I always feel like um, well, I always try to find yeah, something small, like an infograph. And when you think about like what, what you can do with an infograph, you can spend a whole class period just on discussing and working with an infograph. My other example is um, using a short clip. And so this clip here is an advertisement for a new uh, kebab place. The ke kebab place is called King of Kebab. And it's from the movie called Kebab Connection that came out in 2004. And some of you might argue now, uh oh, Melanie, this is a very old film. Why would you show such an old film? As I said, I'm not showing the, old, the whole film. I'm only using the advertisement here. And I would argue it's still relevant to nowadays because Dona is one of the most popular fast food items that are, also that people eat in Germany. And so this uh, advertiser is pretty funny. Um, it's a big uh, martial arts uh, fighting scene uh, about, uh, over the last Döner that they have left over at the end of the night. And so the students, again, I just did this recently, so the students only had six, uh, five, five, six months of German learning when I asked them to watch this clip and to answer the question that you see here to the side. And yes, they answered in German, but for your sake, I wrote it down in English. So they had to um, answer uh, the question, who do you see in the clip? What are they doing? Where are they? When does this clip take place? And what is it all about? And so, I mean, I tell my students too, it's not necessarily that you have to understand every single word, but with the beauty with visuals, um, you have so much input just through the pictures that you can figure out when does it take place in the evening? I mean, you can you can tell to it. It's a very dark, um, a very dark inside this room. So I'm abend. It's not very difficult. And so then afterwards, you know, we discussed, you know, how people could maybe advertise for a specific American fast food over here. Or another idea would be to uh, use other typical German fast foods, you know, uh, or food in general that maybe Americans are not familiar with. And then think about a way to market that particular German food item off to an American audience. So again, you have here the intercultural uh, competence connection as well. All right, um, I would like to give you a chance now to ask some questions and answers. You can use uh, the question answer function and Chris will be picking a couple of questions and read them out to me. And I will be more than happy to answer them. All right. Oh, so, no. oh, sorry, Chris. I was just going to jump in. Thank you so much for that, that wonderful presentation. As Melanie said, we're going to open the floor to some questions right now. And, and I'm actually going to read one to you right now, Melanie. Um, okay. So Aaron would love to know more about your thoughts on learner-based text versus authentic texts. For example, non-learner-based texts. Yeah. No, exactly. So, I mean, the big difference is that if it's a learner-based text, then that would be a, a text written for a language learner in mind. So, speak that if I was to write now a short story for my students, and I really want my German one students to be all pumped uh, up about you know what they already know in German, I would really rely on the vocabulary that they know already, and then I might maybe incorporate five new words that I'm most certain they can figure out out of context. And there may be three words that are brand new to them. So that way, you know, they have maybe like as of five to eight words that they don't know. And so they, they feel successful. So this basic word is so a learner-based text is one that is designed with the language learner in mind versus an authentic text. It's really a text that has been written by a native speaker for a native speaker. So they're not thinking about Ooh, which synonym could I use to make it a little easier? So in my case, for instance, instead of saying üben, which means to practice in German, we have a synonym in German, and that is trainieren. And so I could say also, okay, jetzt trainieren wir, instead of üben. And I might do that in the first, like, you know, two to three weeks of German 1, where I say trainieren, trainieren, trainieren. And then I start sneaking in the synonym, where, where I, as I exchange trainieren von üben. I hope that makes sense. Wonderful. I uh, just wanted to relate to you as well. You have lots of compliments in here of, of 
your wonderful Aww. slides, information, and some people recognizing graphs that they also use in the classroom. So there's a couple, there's there's a lot of questions here for you. So I'm just going to keep uh, sending them off to you. So um, one of our participants struggles to find usable, authentic resources from the internet for all levels mm -hmm. for each day. Do you have any recommendations for them? Okay, so what I do, because I agree, so if I use just a regular internet browser and I would type in, you know, in, as in the target language, you know, something that I'm looking for, um, you as oftentimes get um, materials that I, you know, read it through an American browser. So what I would recommend if you look for French resources, put the FR, so whatever, google.fr, or in my case, google.de or google.ch, and then see what on the as on, on Google for the specific country comes up. And then again, you know, think about adapting the, te the task to the text. And also what you can do too, is like when you, like now for the more advanced level students, if you have a very good article, you know, from a magazine, and it's like super lengthy. And because it has also lots of uh, pictures and whatnot, and rather than giving you a, let's say, intermediate student a handout of five pages of that beautiful article uh, on environmental protection, uh, for instance, uh, you can also use a PDF. It's a Chromebook, as a Google Chrome extension, a PDF cutter, and you can just really take cut passages out of that article that you would like your students to read. Oftentimes, too, with novels, when you think about like novels that you want to read with your students. They are sometimes like lengthy descriptions of landscape scenes and whatnot. I mean, is it really important to the plot? Not necessarily. So I'm uh, of the opinion that I cut this part out because it would be not, not, not necessarily wasted time, but maybe unnecessary time to use in my class in my class with my students because it doesn't really matter too much about the plot. And I would say I'm also an English teacher. I would never say that uh, to an English teacher to cut out uh, scenes um, necessarily about landscape descriptions, but for our, for our learners who are maybe more challenged with how difficult the language is, I would just cut out important things or not, and unimportant things. Wonderful, thank you. So another question, it says, do you do culture in every lesson? Yes, as I think I can confidently say yes, um, I, as I didn't even know that that was a thing uh, to teach language through culture because I have always done it. And when people started talking about it, I was like, hey, is this new? This is how I have always done it. So, uh, I mean, in my district, we ha I have a textbook and I lean on the textbook, but unfortunately it's extremely gram grammar heavy. And I think as a grammar, grammar is important. However, what do I want my students to be? I want my students to be confident and I want my students to leave my classroom confident in being able to speak the language. And so I uh, sure teach grammar, but I teach it hidden. So what I mean with this is I use, um, you know, everything what I, what I uh, just did uh, the other day. I, I just want to give you another example. Um, uh, now I'm blinking. <laughs> oh, okay. So, for example, I, I just with my German two students, we were our topic is means of transportation. So I thought it would be exciting to uh, look in, uh, at the fact that uh, the street signs just have been uh, changed out in Germany for for the last like five years. They have been modernized. You know, like there's a sign, for instance, you know, as a, like with as a circle a sign with a, a red circle for attention. In the middle, you see a train in steam coming out on top. But now they have a more modern uh, form of that picture with obviously a train, not with steam, uh, coming out on top. So we looked at the, at, at the signs and they had to decide which was the new, which was the old sign and why is this the new sign, not the old sign and whatnot. But then we went in, even deeper into the an argumentation and like, and how far is it feasible and also maybe the best idea to use a lot of money to replace signs just because they're a little older. You know, like because there's steam coming out of the train. A sign usually costs between 80 to 150 dollars. And I mean, I don't know how many signs they have to replace, but I think it's going to be a lot of money. So again, so we used this the signs and the, the signs being changed to as a as a um, starting point to have a discussion about how cities or states spend money um, for means of transportation. So it's easy. I, I think it's easy, and I do it all the time to answer your question. 
which explains the teacher of the year award. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, so there's, there's, there's a couple more, a couple more questions. One is asking about um, the video clip that you showed, you cited as a YT player. Can you just identify where you found that clip? Oh, it is, uh, I just, uh, on YouTube. Um, so the, 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 the reason why I found it was because I watched the movie many, many years ago and I just thought that that, that scene of the advertisement is just ridiculous. I mean, Döner is a German Turkish food, so it's invented by a Turkish, uh, a Turk who lived in Germany. He unfortunately died uh, recently. And so what do martial arts have to do with a Turkish German food? So I just, I just thought it was ridiculous. And I remember the movie and so I just tried to find the movie on YouTube. And so I was lucky to find it. Wonderful, thank you. We have a, a couple questions about uh, just some tips from you about music. Do you have any tips on how you would find music that has appropriate language for high school students? Yeah, so, so okay, so what I do, I just listen to German radio channels, uh, radio, not channels, stations, German radio stations, because when living not in Germany, I don't really know what kind of like, you know, the new songs in the charts are and whatnot. And so I listen to the radio when, I, when, I, when I'm in the car off my phone. So I would just as a look for, um, I mean, everything is online now, you know, uh, so all these uh, radio stations uh, you can access through the internet. And so I would be just listening to songs. And if you find one that has have a cool B that you enjoy, you know, then I would just look up the lyrics for the song online. So I just, uh, for instance, used the song from the Lumpenpack. It's called Ford Fiesta because we're talking about means of transportation. And in that um, video clip, they're talking about going on vacation to Italy in the sister's Ford Fiesta and the Ford Fiesta is breaking down. So this was a perfect song because our previous suit was like going on vacation and whatnot. And now we talk about uh, means of transportation and cars and what car, type of car do you have or do you want and whatnot. And so this song just perfectly fit in. But that's how I found it by listening to, um, to the radio. Wonderful, thank you. Another question, how do you use authentic resources on tests? Mm -hmm. So um, this is what I mentioned earlier. It's the so-called IPA, Integrated Performance Assessment. And so they are uh, also made out of three parts, the interpersonal, uh, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational parts. So the interpretive is usually a video clip, an audio recording, or a writing. And you ask some vocabulary questions about, some inference questions about it, uh, main idea, and also the student's own opinion on it. And then the uh, presentational um, task is usually as a, of this of uh, I give an example of what we just recently did. Um, for instance, when the students, you know, your, your topic is uh, let's talk, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, you know, professions and whatnot. And now that we're getting closer to summer vacation, uh, I picked out a couple of summer job posts from, from a German website and I put it on a piece of paper and gave to students. And I told them that they have, uh, or this is my interpersonal example, that they have to discuss with each other what of the six um, jobs that they are offered to work, they would like to work with each other. And then when we have the presentational tasks, the presentations where maybe the students could talk about their future plans um, when they you know, graduate high school, when they graduate university, of what they want to be when they grow up. So this is what I do. I use integrated performance assessment and here I can use authentic resources. All right, we're gonna do one or two more questions for the for time yep. purposes. Uh, this one says, what are your thoughts on practicing grammar through drill-like activities for novice learners in particular? As I have to say, and maybe some people don't agree with me, but I feel like it's necessary. I mean, there's no way around it. I mean, at some point the student will wonder why the heck do I say do leaps? So in German we have as inflections, so that means the endings of verbs change. And so after a while they're like, why the heck is there always like do leaps? But er leaped a t at the end. And I feel if if the students bring it up, then I expect as I explicitly explain, oh, that's an interesting observation. You know that we have different endings on here, and this is why we do it. So I oftentimes um, do it through discovery. 
So rather than saying, okay, today, you know, we're going to learn about the present tense and we have personal pronouns, ich do LCS, and here are the present tense endings, and I'll memorize it, um, you know, it, I don't think that this is the way to go. Usually the first three, four weeks, I'm just all about students um, like memorizing phrases and using them over and over again. You know, we do that a lot through songs and movement. Uh, I give you an example. Now you hear me sing. Um, but one of the first things we do is like, Guten Morgen. Hallo hier, hallo da. Schön dich zu sehen. Ja und jetzt. Nochmal von vorn. Or another one we do in the beginning is Hallo, hallo, wie geht's dir? Guten Morgen, guten Morgen. Lasst uns anfangen. So they're learning all these like little phrases and questions and answers through songs. Um, and then I start using it. And as I just had pointed out, after a while they're like, why do I say wie geht's dir and not wie geht's du? And then I then I then I obviously address it. Wonderful, thank you. And the final question, and possibly the hardest, how did you mm -hmm. assess students' interpersonal skills during the pandemic year? Oh, okay. Um, that is not too difficult either. Uh, this question. So I use. Um, so I just met with them. <laughs> And so um, they had, I gave them like a sign in sheet. They could pick the time when they wanted to meet and they had to, uh, you know, meet with as a, a, a four people in total. So in mini groups and then we just had conversation on different topics, you know? So, so again, like I maybe used an infograph as a base for a conversation. So like one infograph that I had used was uh, about Germans and, you know, their, their vacation time. Like over they do they go on vacation, how much vacation time do they have and like paid and unpaid vacation time and whatnot. And then we use that as a basis to talk about vacation. So like in, as I like first talk about the infograph and once everybody got a little more comfortable, you know, that we start talking about each other and what we want to do on vacation and whatnot. So I ease them in. This is usually how I do it. It's and then what you can also do with interpersonal is just through recordings. Um, what I did too is like I recorded questions and it's that's not spontaneous and it's you know it can be rehearsed which I think is okay especially again in the novice level I want them to be able to redo it and redo it till they're happy with the result so either what I did is I used bookaroo.com to record my questions and so I, I, I said the question left a little bit of time afterwards so the students could answer the question and then they played the recording and used their phones or so and then they recorded and they sent me the recording with their answers. Another thing is Flipgrid. I'm a big Flipgrid fan. Uh, my students do Flipgrid all the time. If it's just like, you know, in the beginning, like practicing pronunciation by saying uh, tongue twisters, maybe reading out a passage or, um, you know, giving mini presentations, to talk about yourself, introduce yourself. What are your favorite topics? What are you going to wear for prom? Stuff like that. Beautiful. Thank you. Of course, that was an easy answer for you. So that ends so. <laughs> our, our, our Q&A session. If we were not able to answer your question today, we are happy to, to engage with you to make sure that we address these questions to Melanie and we provide you with, with uh, responses. We just wanted to say thank you very much for spending the past 45 minutes with us following this webinar you will receive a complimentary email that will include a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides with a bonus item, a blog item, a blog article from Melanie. In addition, there will be resources available on our website, uh, like a downloadable that is authored from Melanie. The downloadable will include the uh, how to select authentic materials and examples for speaking tasks. If your district is interested in the benefits of custom publishing, we welcome conversations with our custom publishing experts to learn more about your unique needs. If you're planning on identifying authentic text or need help identifying authentic texts, we'd love to share with you how easy it can be and how affordable it could be to build your own workbook or reader that's relevant and organized. Our contact screen is on, our contact information is on the screen right now. Again, thank you very much for your participation. We wish everyone good health.